I want you to think about your dream. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbow. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. If I have learned anything, it is the power of hope. It ain't about how hard you hit. The power of one person. It's about how hard you can get one hit. One person can change the world. And keep moving forward. How much, you can, how much you can take. By giving people hope. And keep moving forward. Respect everyone. That's how winning is done. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But if you take some risks. But you got to be willing to take the hits. Step up when the times are the toughest. And not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him. Face down the bully. Or her. Lift up the downtrodden. Or anybody. And never, ever give up. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop running towards your dream. Welcome to The Radical Humanists with your hosts, Dr. Thomas Coleman and Michael V. All right. Was that too rock and roll? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Oh, it's just been a fucking crazy day actually it's been a crazy fucking week actually no it's been a crazy two weeks ah welcome was that too rock and roll let's try that again welcome to the radical humanist a podcast that believes in your right to live free of the social and emotional constraints that limit your human potential i am your host michael v um <laughs> yep, it's going to be that kind of episode. So, uh first off, uh let me just say that I hope everyone listening had a great Thanksgiving and uh yeah, Thanksgiving. I know I'm at least uh <clears throat> I'm at least a week late on this. Um but uh look, hey, you, you get what you pay for, you know what I'm saying? So, uh but anyway, so for those that don't celebrate Thanksgiving, I I know uh we have a lot of listeners that are across the pond and down the way. Um, I hope you had a great typical Thursday and you got to do all those great Thursday activities, whatever those might be on your end. Uh, I apologize for not releasing an episode last week <clears throat> and delivering this episode later than usual. Um, it really has just been a busy two weeks. Um, that's not an excuse or a cop out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. God, man, I'm a, I'm a... I'm a mess today. Um, so, yeah, that's not an excuse or a cop out. Um, I, it, you know, it's not that I didn't have enough time uh, because as I've, as I've mentioned plenty of other times, there's no such thing as not enough time. And that's just a bullshit cop out excuse that people use. And if there's one thing uh, that I hate, it's winter. That's right, winter. And if there's another thing I hate, it's clowns. But beyond that, beyond winter and clowns, I hate excuses. And the truth is, I just had more pressing things to take care of, like, you know, holiday preparation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, things like this podcast and my other artsy endeavors, uh, they just had to take a backseat. But just know it doesn't mean that I don't love you. I do. You you know I do. I love each and every one of you. Um, and if I could, <clears throat> I would come out there and give you all a hug and a squeeze and squeeze you all up in there and hug all the nooks and the crannies and the bits and the jumbles and the giblets. Uh, but, you know, there's COVID going on, so there's a minimum of six foot distance. So you all get virtual giblet hugs. Anyway, so listen, let's just stop fucking around. I'm fucking around. You know why I'm fucking around? <clears throat> I have a new um, addiction. If you've listened to this podcast, you know that I am like a serial junkie. Like I love cer- – not like I'm a junkie consistently, but like I, I love breakfast cereal and therefore I am a cereal junkie. Um, but I love all nonsense snack foods even if I don't eat it. It's just the kind of thing that like I see it on a shelf and I'm attracted to it because of the bright colors and the funny names and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and more often than not, I'll actually buy something. And I'll never eat it. It'll just sit in my cabinet or on my shelf until I either give it to a friend or put it in a box and mail it to somebody. But the exception to that rule – my god, I'm really sorry. The exception to that rule is that um, 7-Eleven, which for those that don't know – I think there's 7-Eleven like 
across the world, right? Everyone knows what 7-Eleven is. If you don't, it's a convenience store. It's a mini mart. They're open 24 hours. You can get everything from bread and milk to coffee to condoms to stay erect pills to chewing tobacco. It's one of these catch-all stores. <clears throat> anyway, 7-Eleven has their own brand. It's called 7-Eleven Select. And every season... Uh, so every couple of months, they release a brand new package or or collection of packages of seasonal cookies, right? They come in a two. You know what? I'm filming this right now, so I'm going to hold this up to the camera. See, look, this is what I'm talking about. So you're actually going to have to go and look at our video to see what I'm talking about. But here's one of them. And this is – it's seasonal, so it's, it's Christmas time. Um, so these are pomegranate cream – and then they have also pecan pie cream. And I have to stop fucking around because that, for some stupid reason, I put these cookies right in front of me. And now it's like all I can think of. All I want is these cookies. So I'm like racing through this podcast so I can stop and I can eat those cookies. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so let's <clears throat> let's stop fucking around. <laughs> and dive. let's dive right into this week's topic. And this week's topic, if you watched my uh, my little teaser video, is about habits. We are all about habits. Um, and before I start talking about that um, and before I really dive into the subject, I want to acknowledge that in the world of like wellness and self-help and motivation and, and you know, be your best self and all that, in that world <clears> – <throat> Talking about habits is an easy grab. It's it's like a well-worn topic that literally everyone who does this covers. And there's a reason for that. It's it's because it makes very easy content because it's extremely relatable. Everyone has habits. Um, and more often than not, if you find this subject, the subject of habits and adjusting habits – uh, even the slightest bit compelling, it's because you have a bad or an unhealthy habit that you're looking to change. And I mean, nobody that has a healthy or productive habit seeks out some kind of external motivating force to get them to change. That's just not how that works. So when people talk about habits, they're looking for positive affirmations and reassurances. They are looking to make a better way. And and that's got, that's that's good. I'm not belittling that. We should all be working on ourselves all the time. And in my opinion, the best people out there are the ones that realize they are a constant work in progress. It's just a, a, a never-ending system of updates. Uh, think of it like your phone, like the OS on your phone is constantly updating. That's how you should treat yourself. So taking stock of things you want to change and acknowledging uh, what they are and why they have a negative impact on your life and then understanding and embracing the necessary steps to change these behaviors is fundamentally good. The reason I bring this up as a well-worn cliched topic is because in my experience, a lot of people <clears> – <throat> Talk about the step-by-step -step, uh, process to altering habits as if you're, you know, building a coffee table from Ikea. And it's not it, – it, it simply is not that easy. It's never that easy. Nothing is that easy, not even building a coffee table from Ikea. So, it, you know, it's not like you can drink four glasses of water, do 25 sit-ups, insert dowel rod A into cam fastener B, have kale for dinner, wax on, wax off, and pray to your crystal moon god to wait for the change to overcome you. And that's why a lot of people fail to correct habits. They take a literal step-by-step -step approach without doing any of the mental homework. <clears throat> and seeing as how habits by nature are things we do subconsciously, any physical activity you do without the conscious brain mechanics are meaningless. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that I have all the answers for everyone out there. But I think I have enough answers for some of you 
And maybe if what I say rubs off on you, you can then find a way to, to rub it off on someone else. And then they can take that good rubbing and rub another person until everyone is sufficiently rubbed and satisfied. And sad it's – you know what? This is just getting weird. Let me get back on track. Okay. Habits. Let's, let's talk. So the first step to solving any problem is understanding it. Right? You, you, you simply – if your car breaks down, you can't fix it unless you know what's wrong. You can't just sort of you know, bang a rock on the hood and be like, abracadabra, and then you have to understand why it's broken. So the first step, solving any problem, understanding it. So what is a habit? A habit is an acquired mode of behavior that has become nearly or completely involuntary involuntary meaning done without will or conscious control and this could mean anything things that you know and you acknowledge as habits like smoking or biting your nails or picking your nose or picking someone else's nose but it can also be things that you personally in your own life have labeled as something else uh, attributing behaviors to um to to other you know giving them other labels like for instance you know constant lateness uh procrastination avoidance techniques these are these can all be habitual so the first step is understanding what habits are and then identifying the ones you want to change now if you've ever at any point in your life given this subject any amount of thought Right, you've you, you've you've looked into wanting to adjust habits. You've acknowledged that you have bad habits. If there has ever been a point in your life in the past thirty years that you thought maybe this was something you were interested in, there's a good chance that you've come across, or at the very least, you've heard of the book "The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People" by Stephen Covey. Um, it was first published in 1989, and it has sold like something over like 25 million copies. It's it's just an incredibly popular book. Does that mean it's a good book? That depends on your expectations and what you're looking for. What is your definition of good? Uh, 50 Shades of Grey, by comparison, has sold over 125 million copies. And that book is a dead dog rolled in dog shit. So the word good is relative at best. Um, but it has been around for 30 years, so there's definitely something to it. Um, but I would say that, you know, if this is something you're interested in and you haven't read it, maybe after you're done listening to this, start there. Um, it's not an expensive book. There's an audio version. I believe there was also a video component at some point, like maybe like a made for TV movie or something. I, I brief, I remember something about it being on VHS years ago. And for those of you that don't know what VHS is, you're just going to have to Google that because I'm old. Anyway, um, but I, let me give you a, a very, very brief uh, summary of that book so that you understand how it's structured. Um, because it's, while it is sort of a step-by-step -step progression, there is mental homework involved. Um, the author, uh, Stephen Covey, he he puts the first three steps, the first three of the seven steps under the headline of independence, right? So first three steps deal with you gaining control of, uh, you know, basically everything, gaining control of yourself, gaining control of your, your actions, gaining independence. And independence is something that is absolutely critical to creating better habits. Um, so step one of the seven steps is to be proactive. Uh, reactive people, not proactive, reactive people take a passive stance. They believe the world is happening to them. They say things like, well, there's nothing I can do. That's just the way I am. They think the problem is exterior. It's out there. But that thought is in fact the problem reactivity becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and reactive people feel increasingly uh, increasingly victimized um, and out of control, the things that are out of control. Um, <clears throat> proactive people, on the other hand, 
recognize they have responsibility or a response slash ability. And uh, the author, Covey, defines as the ability to choose how you respond to a given stimulus or a situation. So if you think about that for a minute, um, just to simplify that, uh, reactive people, you know, this is just the way things are. I can't change it. Proactive people take literally a, an active stance and an active acknowledgement against situations. Um, so that's the first step is to be proactive, to put yourself in that proactive state of mind. The second step is to begin with the end in mind. Um, this is a lot like when I was talking about goals. Uh, start with a very clear destination in mind. Map out where you want to be specifically. Um, you can use your imagination to develop a vision of what you want to become and use your conscience to decide what it is, what are the values that will guide you there. So when I was talking about goals, I had mentioned that I like to use vision boards because vision boards are physical, visual representations of my goal, right? So like, here's a picture of what I want, where I want to end up. Begin with the end in mind. And step three for the first seven steps under independence is first things first, which is just a system of prioritization. And it's that simple. The next three habits are listed as interdependence um, or working with others. So, you know, it's, it's not a go it alone sort of situation. So the fourth step is to think win-win. Now, when viewing success <laughs> and the uh, the sitting president that we have in this country is a perfect example of this. But when viewing success, there are multiple variations of the winning formula. So there's win, which is just a simplified version of you taking a very selfish approach and it's all just win and it's all just for you. There is you win and because nobody else wins. So your win is not based on your achievements. It's based on because somebody else didn't win. There is win-lose, which means you win only because somebody else loses, and so on and so on. There's, there's different levels of this. So commit yourself to thinking win-win, creating win-win situations that are mutually beneficial and satisfying to each person or party, right? The next step, uh, the fifth step, is seek first to understand, then be understood. Now, this is also a very popular um, uh, principle with um, aligning yourself with other people, right? So finding that universal alignment. Seek first to understand then be understood before we can offer advice, suggest solutions, or effectively interact with another person in any way, we must seek to understand them and their perspective, you know, through sort of, of a form of empathy, right? Um, not compassion, not pity, not basic understanding, but almost empathic listening. Put yourself where they are and try to understand them. And only then can you be understood. So the sixth sixth step, excuse me, and I, I, I'm going to preface this by saying I, I fucking hate this word. I really, really hate this word. Um, but the sixth step is synergize. You've got to synergize. I hate that word because it has been co-opted uh, by into the lexicon of industry jargon, and it fucking it, it infuriates me to no end because in my day to day, my nine to five, I have to deal with people who love industry jargon. They just love synergy. But anyway, uh, the sixth step is synergize. Is synergize, and what that really just means is um, 
by understanding and valuing the differences in another person's perspective, we have the opportunity to create synergy or simply put a cooperative interaction, two or more things working together to achieve an end. It allows us to uncover new possibilities through openness and creativity, and it's why collaborative creativity is beneficial. So then finally, we're up to step seven, um, and that is sharpen the saw. Now, this is something that if you've listened to this podcast in the past, you've heard me talk about. Um, I talk about this quite a bit. To be effective, we must devote the time to renewing ourselves physically, spiritually, mentally, and socially. Continuous renewal allows us to synergetically increase our ability to practice each of these habits. I put that under the umbrella topic of never stop growing. In that seventh step, <clears throat> the way this book is laid out is the acknowledgement and the understanding of what he, the author, calls the four dimensions of our nature, of the of a human nature. And those are physical dimension, spiritual dimension, mental dimension, and social emotional dimension. Right? And and this is all very basic stuff. If you've ever done any kind of um if you've ever invested yourself in spirituality or in any of those practices, these all come into play. This is not simply – this is not something he really made up for this book. This is this is well-worn territory at this point. But <clears throat> within the explanation of those dimensions, right, within the explanation of what the physical dimension is and what the spiritual dimension is are tips to honing and sharpening – sharpen the saw, sharpening them. So for instance, like with the physical dimension, it's it's things like eat well and exercise, you know, that kind of thing. Things that keep your physical saw sharp. <clears throat> with spiritual, it's meditation, it's commune with nature, so on and so forth. My favorite, and again, this is something I am constantly preaching, um, it's, it's for the social and emotional dimension and it's to seek – to understand people and to be of service to others. So that in a nutshell is the seven habits of highly effective people. And again, um, I mean, you know, there's more to it and, but those are the cliff notes. And I, again, I, I really recommend, um, if this is a topic that you're interested in, go dig up this book. Um, trust me when I tell you it'll be worth every penny. Um, and you know, I'm I'm not here to give you a book report per se. <clears throat> I just wanted to give you a foundation for understanding the nature of habits and you know how to begin to correct them and why they are so goddamn hard to change. Um but I would I I would like to add a few things <clears throat> excuse me. Man. I would like to add a few things uh that have helped me beyond you know, what's in that book. Hang on one second. I just, I got to get a drink. Hold on. <sighs> Sorry, man. I'm still looking at those cookies. Woo! Okay. So yeah, I want to just, uh, I want to briefly add a couple of things that are not in that book, but, but have helped me to, um, at the very least, uh, find habits that, um, I didn't even know I had to be honest with you, things that, <clears throat> you know, because these things are subconscious, because you don't know you're doing them, it, it, it's it's very hard for you to find them out on your own. Usually, <clears throat> if you do have a bad habit, it's pointed out by somebody else. Thankfully, that's not the case here. Um, and, and to that end, I would like to just quickly point out that not everything that is called a called out is necessarily a habit. And that includes things that most people consider to be inherently bad. And and, and what I mean by that is, you know, <clears throat> everybody's different. We're all just tiny little snowflakes, individual and unique. Now, there are, I don't want you to mistake preferences for habits or preference, personal preferences for bad habits, because that in and of itself is a bad habit. If you do something that 
bothers me, but doesn't necessarily affect you or your quality of life or it's something that you like, that's not, that doesn't mean that it's a bad habit. If I constantly do that, <clears throat> if I constantly call these things out to other people, the bad habit is mine. And that bad habit is, is being judgmental and, and, you know, finding fault with everything. But for, for example, let's say that you smoke, right? Smoking has been universally determined to be an unhealthy addiction and it is habit forming. Now, if you are addicted to cigarettes and if you, um, have an unhealthy habit and you smoke, okay. But if you enjoy it, if you derive genuine pleasure out of it, even if you know the inherent risks behind it, but you have made that choice, you've made that conscious decision. I'm going to smoke because I do enjoy it. I like the smell. I like the flavor. I love that my fingertips turn this pale yellow decrepit color and, and my breath smells like you know, a horse's ass, if you've made that choice, then realistically, it's very hard for somebody to label it a habit. Yes, by its technical definition, but where it's also a choice. And if something is a conscious choice, can it really be labeled a habit? Because habits are something we do without knowing it, usually. Um, so I want just to point out that, um, you know, all of this, everything you do that involves some sort of change needs to come from a place of honesty within yourself first. Otherwise, <clears throat> what's the point? You don't change for other people um, before you change for yourself. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands that not everything that you always, you have always heard is a habit or can be labeled, you know, thusly. So getting back, um, <clears throat> for me personally, um, overcoming some of the habits that, you know, I was looking to unravel and do away with because they no longer served me. And, and also that is another thing. Sorry to keep getting off on off track here, but habits typically are things that, you know, they're, they're almost, a lot of them are, re are reward based. You do X because you get to Y and you do it so many times that you don't even realize you're doing it anymore. Um, and it, and it, they do start out as reward based, but, re, but keep that in mind because that's also a very healthy, um, and, uh, a very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Healthy and blah, 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 it's a, it's a good way to, to adjust your habits, having them be reward based. You're almost like, Pavlov's dog. Um, <clears throat> but so where was it? Right. Okay. So sorry, man. I'm totally off track. I'm just, I'm, I'm literally staring at these two packages of cookies right now. Okay. So for me, when I was looking to undo habits, the ones that no longer serve me well, the ones that sort of lay hidden to me consciously, um, it was, Important first, obviously, for me to acknowledge them and to take the seven steps above that, you know, call them out and blah, 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 and to understand them. Um, but beyond that, I got, I finally, you know, I, nobody succeeds at something the first time out. You just don't. Sometimes you don't succeed the, the 50th time out. Sometimes it takes 60 tries. Sometimes it takes 75. You, the point is you don't succeed the first time out. So for me, the first... Um, uh, you know, the most important and effective, I think that was the word I was looking for before effective has been to expect and embrace setbacks, right? So embrace them, be that obstacles or delays or rejections or failures, whatever, embrace them, truly, truly embrace them. You will never achieve any of your goals if you're afraid to fail and failure is critical to success. You need to understand that, that failure is critical to success. If you succeeded every time, 
you did something for the first time, your accomplishments would have no value. And without value, there's absolutely no achievement. So fail, but don't just fail. Look forward to failing. Do you, I mean, do you know do you know how I finally got a hold of my personal failures, the ones that brought me here to this podcast, the ones that made me decide that I wanted to do this? I embraced them. I embraced my personal failures. In doing so, I robbed them of their ability to hurt or hinder me, and I used them as a catalyst for change. Embrace your failures. Let it happen. And when you do that, you will instinctively develop this sort of spring back sustainability, but not just with habits, with everything. And I mean, that's, that's pretty fucking cool. Um, the next thing, uh, that I, that I did, and this was, this was a tough one because it sounds romantic and it sounds adventurous and, you know, it sounds almost swashbuckling, but you know, this isn't the movies, this is real life, but you have to actively erase the desire for comfort and open yourself up to, you know, growing pains. Um, and this is different than embracing failure because here you're, you're out there searching for uncertainty with passion. Like you're really out, you're vigorously seeking out that which you do not know, Pain and growth go hand in hand. So look for it. Search for it. Make yourself uncomfortable. Just don't do anything stupid. I mean, I'm not talking about physical pain, and I can't believe I even have to say that. Also, while we're on this whole cinematic quality, avoid the whole, you know, sometimes you've just got to say what the fuck frame of mind. It's a, it's that popular, just do it cliche. It works great in movies and not so much in real life. Um, you know, it, it, again, it's one of these things that's just, it's this very romantic notion and it makes for a great story, but in practical applications, it has a lot of failings. Um, do find ways to use your setbacks and the internal feeling of failures to propel yourself forward, even if it's only sort of tangentially connected. And what I mean by that is – I'll give you a real-world example. So I'm recording this podcast, this episode right now on Thursday. And on Monday, four days ago, I got what I thought was a pretty amazing job offer, right? Now – Keep in mind, I have a full-time job or career, whatever you want to call it. Um, for me, though, it's really just something to pay the bills and gives me the opportunity, the time and the opportunity to develop the radical humanist. This and the videos and Instagram and Facebook and all that go with it. Um, this, like all of this is um, – it really is like – my passion. I love doing this. Um, and everything else is really just a means to the end. So, you know, this new job offer was just that. It was just a job offer doing more of what I already do, but it was for more money. And that meant, you know, to me, that means more resources I would have for this. So, um, I was mildly excited, but I'm cautiously optimistic. It's a real, it's a weird world out there right now. Job offers are very sort of um, few and far between, and the ones that do come up in my line of work are a little sketchy. Anyway, um, so since Monday, I've had several back and forth emails with someone claiming to be their HR person at for this new position, and. Uh, with each email, I got sort of more and more suspicious that something didn't wasn't right. Like it just didn't feel right. Um, and because of that, with each message that didn't feel right, I was getting more and more dejected. You know, um, yeah, I was just getting more and more bummed out. Um, then this morning, I received another email from them that basically confirmed 
that everything they had been sending me was a bullshit scam, right? So uh, it was a very – it was an impressively involved and well-played scam, but it was it was a scam nonetheless. And it was really just ended up being somebody fishing for my personal information. So like at that point, I was really – you know, I was bummed. I, 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 I had – put a lot of emotional stock into this and I, um, you know, not that I was, uh, not that I did anything to, um, you know, put myself in a position where I was relying on the money from this new job, but still, you know, you get into a frame of mind and when it can't, when it turned out to be nothing but bullshit, I was, I won't lie, I was a little depressed. But instead of wallowing in it, I reminded myself that I have better things. I have more important things to do with my life. It was, you know, I was better than the job that I was being offered. I was much better than the job that was being offered. And I shouldn't waste my time on things that don't help me reach my own goals. And so I started writing down notes for this episode instead, instead of wallowing around, feeling sorry for myself, feeling dejected, feeling like a failure, I decided instead to be proactive, embrace my failures, and use them to propel me forward. And so I started writing down some notes for this episode. And now, here I am. And even if nobody ever hears this episode, I moved myself forward. It was a small step, admittedly, but any forward movement is progress. And progress is what breaks habits. See? Connected. Sometimes, yeah, you have to be your own cheerleader. You know, you you can't be hard on yourself. You've got to give yourself your own positive reinforcement and reassurances. Um, one of the key steps, in fact, to forming new habits is to ease up, right? Not just on yourself, but ease up on where you put yourself and create an environment where new and better habits thrive. So think about this. 43% of our daily actions are habitual, right? Almost half of what you do every day is due to habits. Excuse me, I need another drink. That's very unprofessional of me. I'm sorry. It's a bad habit. Almost half of what you do every day, you do because of habits. And we have this built-in sense that we are in charge of everything and we take responsibility for everything we do, and that's fine, but it's false. Um, what you do, for the most part, reflects habits, not desires and goals. So the implication shouldn't be changing behavior is as easy as making a decision to do something different, right? So like you're going to sit there, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror and you're going to say, I'm going to lose weight and presto change, oh bingo bango, you've suddenly cracked the secret weight loss code. Your environment plays a role in your habits and changing your environment is way more effective than trying to change your will. And there's the word again, effective. I got to remember that. That's the word I was looking for. Willpower is actually not really a very reliable system because as soon as things start to get difficult, we talk ourselves out of the commitment we made. And that's because the very act of inhibiting a desire makes the desire much, much bigger in our minds and sometimes consumes us. Think about somebody telling you you can't do something and then think about how much you want to do it, you know, after, after being told that. Um, it's the same theory. It's the same principle, the same – thought process, you know, um, inhibiting a desire makes that desire bigger to us and, and becomes, can become all consuming. So instead of just changing your thinking, change your environment. 
And practical applications of that are simple. I mean, they, they're going to sound simple, but without follow through, they're meaningless. So for instance, do you want to eat healthier? Then stock your refrigerator with healthy foods, right? It, it seems like a no brainer. You want to be less of a slave to your phone? Start by turning off your social media notifications. Do you want to stop procrastinating? Remove the things you use to procrastinate with. If if you haven't done the laundry, if it's just piling up and you haven't done the laundry, but you have emailed, you know, your buddies two dozen memes, shut off your phone or walk away from your laptop. Change your environment. Another tip on how to uh, on how to make this, you know, these changes stick is to make your new behavior enjoyable. And this is what I was talking about by saying it's reward-based, most of us, by and large, we're not going to repeatedly do something that we don't enjoy, right? I mean, that makes sense. And you're not going to form a habit for something that you hate. So even if you've chosen something that you don't enjoy, try to find a way to make it fun and or to make it rewards based. So, for instance, let's say you, you know, again, you want to get in shape and you hate running, right? Maybe you, you know, that means stopping by your favorite coffee shop or breakfast spot after you've had your morning run. Or, you know, treat yourself to a, a favorite episode, you know, an episode of your favorite show after you've put the laundry away. Make it reward-based. Give yourself something tangible to look forward to. And it will make the task of change more bearable. And then finally, and again, this is a no-brainer, man. Repeat. 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 Let me repeat that. Repeat. Repetition is key to learning anything new. Anything, habit, skill, ability, whatever. Do it and do it again. Then do it again. Then do it another time. There was a study. I wish I had it in front of me. This is one of the notes I took. Um, It takes about two months to make a simple change. And in this study, they were talking about a health change. So it takes about two months to make a simple health change. And the more complex the behavior, the longer it, it generally takes. Um, but usually 60 days, two months is a good ballpark estimate for the average person to form or to break a habit. Um, and it's, you know, it's not like if you miss a day, everything falls apart. No, if you miss a day, habit memory takes a long time to form, um, and a single or double skip or cheat day isn't going to wipe it away. So I know these sound simple, right? And I think they're meant to be. The The words on the page are easy to digest. The actions behind them are a little bit harder. But it, it is just like everything else that we preach about on this podcast in that if you want to change if you want to get better, if you want to get well, if you want to get past whatever it is, you have to do the work. These are things that have worked for me only after I was ready to embrace the actual work involved. But it is work. It, it does take time. But it is worth it if you're invested. And that's the thing. So many people want to change because they think it's what they're supposed to do, right? They they listen to podcasts like this one. They read books like, you know, Seven Tips. They see – they're influenced by what they see around them. Um, they covet what's out there that they don't have, Fundamental change, any fundamental change has to come from a deep personal desire. It can't be for somebody else. It can't be for 
you know, for a, any kind of external source, you can get there to a point, but you won't stay there because it's not something that you truly, you, you know, you truly want for yourself. So before any of this, before you do any of this, decide for yourself that this is or this is not something that you want. And there's nothing wrong with saying you don't want it. That's honesty. That takes a lot more courage than saying, than pretending you do. So just remember that moving forward. It is one of the biggest reasons why people fail at, at changes like this. It's because it's something they think they want. You know, beyond not following the necessary mental you know, steps that go to go into it, you know, they, they're almost, uh, they're, you know, they're, all, they're being peer pressured by external influences. So decide if they want, if it's what you want, if you do fantastic, here's a great way to start, pick a habit, any habit that you have that you want to change, that you truly want to change, start here. Let me know what happens. If there's, if it's not, Hey, no skin off my ass. Know what I'm saying? All right. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, We're not going to do letters this week. We're not going to do so what's up with you this week. Um, Tom's going to be back next week and I'll just pick it up with him there. In the meantime, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, You can email me at hello at the radical humanist.net. You can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram. Um, And if you're out there and you're listening, can you please do me a favor, rate and leave a review of this podcast on whatever app you're listening to. Um, It really is really helps us out in the ratings and helps us get noticed. Uh, I sure would appreciate it. All right, Radicals. Again, thank you for tuning in. I will see you next week. Peace.